Hello and welcome to Roli Pulse brought to you by Roli Books. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please go do so now. You can also find these videos on Roli Books' Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, we at Roli Pulse are very proud to be celebrating the Pride Month and this conversation is on the Section 377 battle, symbolically significant to the queer community in India. While queer lives and the queer movement are much larger, heterogeneous, layered, and go back decades, today we are glad to be looking at the key highlights of one specific legal battle that found itself at the center of the movement as perceived by some. We have with us Ritu Dalmia, who describes herself as persistent and insists that this persistence got her to work in a family marble business as a teenager that allowed her to open her first restaurant without any training at the age of 22 and then later to fight for her sexual freedom which led to the Supreme Court's landmark decision on the LGBT rights. Born in Calcutta to a Marwari family business, Ritu joined the family stone business when she was just 16. Her work kept taking her to Italy, where she developed a liking for the local cuisine and learned uh, how to cook it efficiently. Ritu has successfully set up restaurants like Meza Luna, Latitude, Viva, among others. She then went uh, on to open Vama, an Indian fine dining restaurant in London. The restaurant was a big success and won rave reviews. Uh, in the year 2000, she came back home to India uh, to open the now popular restaurant Diva. Uh, Dalmia has never looked back, then going on to open one award-winning restaurant after another and managing the staff of 300 plus since then. We also have Saurav Kirpal, who's worked at the United Nations briefly in Geneva before returning to Delhi, where he's been a practicing lawyer at the Supreme Court of India for over two decades. He's appeared in a range of matters involving fundamental rights and was counsel for Nakte, Johar, Ritu Dalmi, and others in the case that we're going to be talking about today. As a self-described accidental activist, he is also a trustee of the NAS Foundation. Uh, <laughs> author of the forthcoming book Sex and the Supreme Court, an anthology about issues relating to gender and sexuality. Uh, Ritu and Saurabh are going to be in conversation with Pragya. Pragya Tiwari is a journalist and policy consultant with over 15 years of experience in journalism. She's led publications such as Vice India, Tehelka, The Big Indian Picture as editor, and has contributed her writings and reportage to several Indian and international publications such as Hindustan Times, Mint Lounge, L. The New York Times and Al Jazeera. So, welcome to Roli Pulse, Saurav Ritu, and Pragya. I'm very delighted to have you for this discussion. Thank you. Pragya, why don't you get us started with this chat? Thank you, Chirag. Uh, thank you all for listening to us. Hello, Ritu. Hello, Saurav. Hello. <laughs> Happy Pride Month to everyone. And with that, I'm going to dive right in, try and make the maximum use of time that we have. Ritu, I'm going to start with you. The first question I have for you is that when you sort of got into this legal battle when you became one of the petitioners you know you were you were sort of well settled in life what we call in india well settled in life you know you didn't need to pick new battles you had fought your battles you had won them you had come a long way what is it that made you want to take this up and what was the journey like for you personally so uh, if i'm really very honest with you for me, picking up this battle wasn't really a priority in my life. As you said yourself, uh, India that way is quite a hypocritical uh, society, especially in urban societies like Delhi, etc., where you're well settled, you're well known, uh, people know. But so for me personally, per se, uh, I had no issues in the sense that I wasn't persecuted or I wasn't being treated like a third grade citizen because of my sexuality. And also, I've always been a very private person. I wanted to be known for what I do, which is for my cooking, for my restaurants, and who I sleep with was just by the way. And then one day I was sitting in, this was when the 2000. 13 judgment was passed in Supreme Court. I was like basically, you know, moaning and groaning about it to my girlfriend. And I said, I mean, this chief justice who's even taken out this has said that he's never met a gay person in his life. She just turned around to me and she says, you people have no business to sit and complain about it. And I said, why is that? She says, people like you 
who have some standing in the society who may have a better chance of being heard don't do anything about it because your life is so secure and nothing is going wrong with it and if you don't do anything about it please do me a favor never ever complain that really was below the belt and somewhere it also touched a chord because that's the truth that is the reality we sometimes are so comfortable in our lives because in some ways okay we may complain about oh in my bank account i couldn't open a joint bank account oh in my insurance company i couldn't put my partner as a nominee but these were still smaller issues the bigger issues you know which later in life and also before when you were you realize that hang on there are bigger problems than that which are existing and we all are turning a blind eye to it so for me that was it from that day i knew that i had to do my bit into it otherwise i don't dare to complain any more about it so i have to admit it was proving a point to my partner that i'm not so insular about it but it turned into something else altogether coming back to your second part of the question how was the journey for me um as i said in the beginning as i said i didn't even think twice when menika came to me and said will you sign this petition and we spoke about it on a flight she was uh, uh doing a case for me for a property in goa and we were on a flight back from goa to delhi and we just started this discussion and uh, she said all the petitions that have been put so far has been by uh, either nas foundation families parents school teachers but how many actual using the wrong terminology here victims have actually filed the case and she says would you file it or would you sign the and i said yes that was the end of the conversation this was in 2014 if i'm not mistaken and then one fine day i get a call from them and they said okay this is happening and the funny part is there were not too many women who wanted to sign for this petition which also was a very um, you know very strange thing because in indian society gay men still have been more out than gay women there has been more acceptance of gay men because it was like lifestyle type people you know then gay women and also gay women in some ways have had complete extreme experience either has been very easy for them or really very very difficult because most of them were not out because two friends living together is still more acceptable than two men friends uh, living together so getting uh, too many women so finally aisha who was a colleague of mine also signed up and rest is of course all history right um sarab coming to you uh, the part that i'm more again this is such a long and probably multi faceted journey for both of you guys but the part that interests me most is you know the thing about uh, historic judgments is that um we know that they come often uh um, when a lot of different things come together i mean it's never as straightforward as making the right arguments and and drafting the best position um where were i mean i i want you to talk a little bit about the process i mean what were the sort of highs and lows leading up to the judgment for you and what kind of hope and despair did you go through and and what point did you know that there might be a real chance that this could be this could be it well of course like any legal battle there are highs and there lows uncertainties and predictabilities excitements and uh, devastations and this case was something like that as well uh, it's almost like a story of a life this case uh, i suppose we can start really before the around the time of the high court judgment mm. there's no point leading up to that because people probably already know but the high court judgment came in 2009 mm. and i think we in india the queer community was completely exhilarated because you know the battles we had seen around the litigation around the world had been tough and hard fought hard but in india even though it was a bit of an effort and there were some snags that before the high court judgment came out once the judgment came it seemed that the country had sort of accepted the gay movement and things had moved on uh, there was no great massive public outcry uh, gay people started coming out 
that was really, I think, the waking up moment for the LGBT community in India, 2009. So when in 2013, the judgment came, it was an absolute shocker and it was devastating. Of course, as a matter of strategy, we should have foreseen this because when the hearings were happening for the case, as Ritu said earlier, one of the judges says, ask the additional solicitor general who's a parent of the government, saying, do you know any gay person? And uh, the ASG actually in horror said, of course, I don't know such person, you know. And the kind of questions that happened during the hearing were about what kind of sexual practices happen. It wasn't much of a discussion of human rights and the rights of the LGBT community. So I suppose we shouldn't have been surprised. And the bench that had been constituted to hear the matter, which ultimately gave the Kaushal judgment in 2013, was a very conservative judge. And I'll come back to this later about what is said about the circumstance which also led to the present judgment. So the judgment came in 2013. Now at this point of time, I was sort of peripherally attached to the, to the case. Uh, Menaka, I know, was more heavily involved in the case. I was just uh, another lawyer in the Supreme Court doing commercial matters, earning lots of money and leading a good life in a way uh, of possibly a lot of other lawyers my age were doing. The only difference was, of course, I happened to be gay. So when the 2013 judgment came, I took it almost as a personal affront. These were judges who I appeared before every day, who I knew, who knew me. And I felt that they had invalidated my personhood, my citizenship, by using phrases like a minuscule minority are not worthy of the rights. It was a, comp a judgment lacking in all empathy and also lacking, I would say, in all legal, legal knowledge. But we were faced with it. Uh, there were a flurry of reviews that happened thereafter. Uh, nothing came of it. The government of the day uh, was, of course, the UPA government was also slightly schizophrenic, I must say, about this. So leading up to the judgment uh, in 2013, they had not taken a positive stand saying that they opposed decriminalization. Uh, but they were good enough to file some reviews saying that, no, the judgment is wrong. Reconsider the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court didn't reconsider it. And sorry, there was the Rahul Gandhi statement after the Supreme Court judgment saying that he respectfully disagrees with the court and is more yeah. inclined to agree with Murali's judgment. So. Right. True, of course. The, the, and hence, it is creditable that the government then did file a review petition challenging the decision. But, you know, sometimes I wonder how much of this is uh, lip service and how much of this is actual uh, uh, belief and actual practice, you see, because the judgment came in December, the elections happened in May, there was plenty of time for uh, legislative intervention and for the judgment to have been undone. Now, it may not have been a priority, but then you have to ask yourself, if it is a priority for you to comment on a judgment and say it's wrong, why don't you actually intervene and, and change it? What I'm trying to say is not that the Congress party or the BJP is any better or any worse. I'm saying that political parties are rather more similar in this than we actually uh, give anyone credit for, you know, or condemn them for, I should say, rather. So this is really not an important issue for most political parties. It's one thing to say things on, on Twitter, which will be forgotten the next day, but to actually do the hard groundwork that, that no political party in India is committed to. Coming back to the case, I suppose, uh, uh, so then the, our legal options were rather limited after the judgment came in 2013. Reviews had been dismissed, curatives were filed. Uh, I remember a very uh, poignant moment uh, in journey when virtually the entire senior bar of the Supreme Court, so the present Attorney General, K.K. Venugopal, former Attorney General uh, Ashok Desai and Mukul Rohadgi, Harish Salve, all the top lawyers, and, uh, they all got together they walked up to the Chief Justice in his courtroom and said, this matter concerns the soul of the Supreme Court. And there is no way that should, one hour after that intervention by the bar, uh, Chief Justice issued his order and said that the curative petitions would be heard in open court. But you know, that was not the end of the matter for us in any case because curative petitions <coughs> are few and far between. They don't often tend to succeed. And as uh, Ritu said earlier, one grave lacuna we had felt in the case was that all kinds of petitions had been filed by Nas Foundation, by parents, by teachers, by psychiatrists, uh, 
a lot of allies of the gay LGBT community, but no actual member of the LGBT community had come themselves and said, this is my life. And that is why I want you, the Supreme Court of India, to intervene to defend my personhood, my citizenship, and my fundamental rights. So I must say, Menaka and Arundhati took a, uh, took a first step in this and asked Ritu and Aman uh, and all to join. Uh, we all decided to file a petition directly in the Supreme Court challenging Section 377, or at least the way it had been interpreted. Uh, the matter went into a bit of a cold storage, as people now know Supreme Court sometimes can put things in cold storage. So things had been put in cold storage, nothing was happening to the case. And we were battling about when is it a good time to actually push the case. Uh, you're always very wary because you don't know, you don't want to take a step which might backfire because you don't know the ideology of a particular judge because a lot does turn upon this, the ideology of the judge. But in any case, we were caught by rather surprise in January of 2018 when the Chief Justice suddenly listed our case and uh, said, well, this matter has to be heard and referred to a bench of five judges. At that point, we were slightly wary as to why is it that the matter has been listed before five judges and why has the judge case been plucked out in this manner? And that got exacerbated really when we saw that, you know, there was a whole range of cases that are pending before the Supreme Court, which have to be decided by what is called the Constitution bench or a bench of five judges. There's a massive backlog. But this particular case was put as the first matter to be heard before all others. So obviously this was something that the Chief Justice wanted to decide. Now we were not sure which way he wanted to decide. He wanted to decide it. But the moment the constitution of the bench was known to us, we actually all breathed a sigh of relief. It was a bench of five judges, who, four of whom, other than the Chief Justice, came from the metros, so Delhi and Bombay. Now already that makes a difference. You know, judges are not plucked from the air or are divorced from the society that they live in. They are very much part of the fabric of, uh, of us, really. So if you have judges who are from the metros, they're more likely to have a liberal outlook. Plus two of the five judges, Justice Nariman and Justice Malhotra, were appointees directly from the bar. They would not gone to the High Court and then come to the Supreme Court. They were actually members of the of bar. They happened to be colleagues of ours also before they became uh, uh, judges. So I think once that constitution of the bench was, uh, was made, we heaved a sigh of relief, particularly because Justice uh, Chanduchud was also on the bench. He is uh, a liberal. He is known for his views on this uh, particular view or on issue. In any case, as the hearing progressed, I think the writing was on the wall from pretty much the first half an hour of the hearing. Because the kind of interventions that the court made, uh, it was apparent that they were completely sympathetic to our cause. Of course, legally, a lot of things had happened in the meanwhile. We had the privacy judgment, we had uh, other uh, Hadiyas judgments and other judgments which had come, which actually bolstered the case. But nothing's over as they say till the fact be sings and here till the five people speak. So the way the hearing went, we were all very, very positive. Because while the petitioner's side, i.e. the side were arguing against the oppressive Section 377, were given just about a day and a half, and our hearings were concluded rapidly, the respondents were actually completely all over the place. The courts didn't seem in, you know, they gave them the leeway because they ought to have been heard. But really, they were also given a short shift. So I think it was with cautious optimism when the judgment was reserved. And when on the 6th of September, 2018, the judgment was pronounced, I think uh, we all went to court, fingers crossed. Ritu was in the crowd. Uh, we were all, uh, she, was, I, she was actually in, I think, not in India at that point of time. Yeah. She, was, she was out, she was traveling and you know, we, had, we knew we had to come and call her the moment we came out. And uh, the judgment started being pronounced. And it was one of the most beautiful moments of my career as a lawyer because even though I wasn't a litigant myself, as a member of the LGBT community was in court there. And I think that probably feeling was shared by everyone outside the court was that the court was speaking for me, really. I was a litigant 
and they were telling me it's all right and all that has happened so far has been all wrong you've been wrong gravely and deeply but don't worry we are here to stand with you and support you and this constitution and this court it means something and we will step in to protect you that's what it meant for me i want to come back to the judgment saurabh but before that i want to ask both ritu and you maybe starting with ritu um you know there's so many battles that um, the community has has been fighting in in different capacities different members different groups within the community have been fighting this was sort of this this thing that brought the entire community the larger community together reading down of 377 what has been the legacy of the judgment is simply in terms of what difference has it made psychologically uh, or on ground what 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 is your sense of the difference that it's made okay so i'll give you very small examples which one saw before and after the judgment uh number one suddenly at all my restaurants i started seeing gay couples coming out without trying to be all hushed up and ordering their dinner and holding hands without any reservation okay earlier it was always you would sense okay my you i would immediately know that it's a gay couple men or women but you would always see a sense of unease when they were in public spaces and right after this judgment there was a sense of more comfort being and this for me as i said it may sound a bit silly but this was really in some ways an example of psychologically what a big difference it made as i said pragya before that someone like me who's financially independent who has made a name for herself i don't suffer as much as the others but the biggest problem i think for a, a you know lgbt community is first acceptance within themselves you know and this is a war it's a journey i was one of the lucky ones i had no problem accepting my sexuality when i was very young i told my mother about it when i was 23 but i've seen a lot of friends around me who are very progressive who come from progressive backgrounds but there's a huge problem in accepting their own sexuality and when you are fighting this inner war and you also know criminally or you are a, per se in eyes of law a criminal that just strengthens it so when the law is on your side then you know hang on what i feel or what i do is actually normal and there are many other people who feel the same way and there is no criminal it's legally also accepted it makes a difference so i think this law is very very important it was very very important for people who have this in a and as i said i had never seen that before till i met people and it's heart wrenching to see what they go through it what they go through just trying to accept it just trying to fight it and it does not matter what community they come from what education level they have what family backgrounds it's a it's a inner war which everyone has a different experience so this was a very and saying coming back to the point when i saw them coming out in the restaurants with lot more ease and comfort that already was a sign that hang on something good is coming out of it so uh, after that again got so many messages on twitter facebook etc that this judgment has given them the strength to come out to their families and which they have been avoiding so from my point of view i think it was a very very important judgment and the difference that i've seen is a lot more comfort a lot more confidence with their own sexuality you know of course that is a big one but then there are of course th- other material things as well in terms of you know for a lot of us who would write about this stuff or who might be um you know pushing for changes within organizations the, the hand wringing that we were met with was constantly that well we would like to reserve spots on the board for uh, people from the lgbtq community but you know it section 3 absolutely, absolutely so it also absolutely. opened up the movement right i mean that that also absolutely where the movement could to ask for further rights could, could absolutely take off but before i go to that sorab i just wanted to 
come back to the judgment for a bit because it wasn't just a judgment that read down that uh, 377. It was also a very powerful judgment in what, on the things that were said, right? And some of us can still never forget some of the absolutely wonderful emotional things that were said during the judgment. For you, what were the key things that, that uh, were said during the judgment that mean a lot for the path forward? 377. You know, it was a section that was barely applied. Uh, of course, the threat was worse than effect. You know, the, the bark was right, but the bark was pretty bad as well. So the case was a lot more about 377. It was about the whole panoply of institutional rights. And to me, the recognition by the court eventually that a member of the LGBT community is entitled to love whosoever they want to and are entitled to the same protections that straight people take for granted. Uh, that was something very important, the right to equality and uh, the sort of irrelevance of your sexuality in your choice of partner uh, is a very important feature of this judgment. And secondly, I suppose the other really great feature of this judgment is the recognition of the humanity and citizenship of an LGBT person. Uh, the idea that you're, you have full sexual autonomy, uh, the state cannot discriminate against you, and that you have a right to uh, free expression. Your, your idea of your sexuality as, as a facet of your personality, which you're allowed to express, that's an extremely important uh, part of the judgment. This judgment is not merely about 377. I think it lays a foundation for a lot of battles we have to fight yet. There were a lot of battles that were fought in the past. This judgment wasn't just a shot in the dark by me and Ritu and five other people. It was part of a process of a lot of other people's work. Uh, it is an event, extremely important judgment, but it is a, at least a foundation, mm. a legal foundation for the battles that we'll have to fight in the future. It's given us the legal tools to be able to go back to court and say, this is what you said in 2018. Now deliver on that promise. Yeah, I want to, uh, you know, I want to actually uh, continue on that, want you to continue on, on that uh, thought and just, um, you know, some of us have been talking about for a very long time about an equality law, you know, saying mm -hmm. that maybe Article 14 and 15 are not quite enough uh, in because of the way things have been playing out for uh, marginalized communities in this country to impose positive duties and obligations, both on the government and private actors. Uh, for non-discrimination against LGBTQIA communities and women and, you know, um, uh, based on like, occupation or caste or whatever it might be. Now, in the absence of such a law, particularly when it comes to the LGBTQIA community, what is it that, what are the milestones that you feel that case law can achieve? And like you said, the judgment is a sort of solid foundation, gives you legal tools. Have those tools been implemented, um, wielded, in the last two years to your satisfaction across high courts in, in the country, of course? Uh, well, the answer to that predictability is, uh, is yes and no. Uh, the tools have been used, the judgment has been used in various high courts, especially by uh, same-sex couples who've gone to court in habeas corpus petitions, saying that they wish to get married and the community is coming in the way. And the courts have actually come to the rescue and said, yes, we will protect you. So it has helped that way. You see the judgment, of course, as regards what it offers for equality is, uh, is rather limited in possibility. The reason is Article 14 applies only to acts of state. And the vast majority of discrimination that gay people face every day is by private people, by society at large, and not necessarily by the state. Uh, so for that, really, how the courts will intervene in the absence of uh, anti-discrimination law is difficult to imagine. Of course, they could be creative the way they were in the case of Vishakha and uh, laid out certain guidelines in case of sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, we need in India a sex discrimination law. Mm -hmm. uh, it's remarkable that some 70 years after independence, we don't have a, a, a gene generic anti-discrimination law which prohibits discrimination Forget sexual orientation, that's something people have become aware to now. But what about simple things like sex? You know, uh, a, a woman can be discriminated against by a private employer 
uh, by a private entity, maybe there will be a certain sex discrimination in employment prohibition or in certain other spheres, but there's no general law governing anti-discrimination. And to me, that's actually just astounding. Article 14 is a promise that was given in the constitution by the constitution makers in a relationship between the individual and the state. The legislature thereafter has had all this time and it has not thought it important to enact a legislation to give basic rights to people uh, and that's when I go back to my earlier point. That it's not about this government or I don't think any politician considers uh, anti-discrimination to be important enough. And it's bizarre because to me, it would actually free up the economy. It is so important to have an anti-discrimination law because it will allow workers to have security. Uh, the positives that come with a law like that, uh, it's just, it's amazing that it's not happened. But to go back to your answer specifically about what the courts can do about it, the courts can do only a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I know it's fashionable nowadays to think that courts can really run the country and to some extent they have to run it when <laughs> the, there is a, a gap in uh, governance by the executive. There is no option. You know, when there is no government or government fails, uh, you can't say fundamental rights uh, can be forgotten. They have not been erased from the constitution. They carry on existing. And that's the job of the court to do. So I suppose the courts will have to step in somehow but their legal tools, the constitutional tools are limited. This is the time for the legislature to do something. Well, the Supreme Court has been uh, gone as far as to intervene in monetary policy. So, you know, uh, <laughs> one still has hope from the courts or uh, otherwise. But, you know, uh, we have very little time left. So I'm going to ask a sort of broad based question. And this is both for Ritu and you. And I'm, uh, I'm going to start with you, Ritu, which is that uh, what are the sort of... Um, what is it that we miss out on? What is the sort of nuance that we miss out on where the struggles of the community, ongoing struggles uh, of the community are concerned when we sort of club the LGBTQIA community together? For example, like you said yourself, Ritu, in the beginning, that the most uh, sort of manifest uh, uh, face of the community has been the gay man, even in India, right? Um, right. But again, transgender people have slightly different um, you know, aspect of struggle that they might need to focus on of, uh, you know, uh, gay women or men. You know, these are, these are sort of different, uh, they're different dimensions to what one has to fight for. And then, of course, this is further complicated by the intersection of caste or class, you know, um, and geography. So I just want to get a sense of what you feel about understanding of... Um, the problems faced by the community, uh, by the society at large, and what are the areas in which the most urgent awareness is needed at this point in time? Ritu, I'll start with you and then Saurabh. So I think uh, one of the biggest problems, I think, is lack of education. When I mean lack of education, I don't mean education in terms of your college degree, but in terms of awareness. So the biggest issue, I think, with uh, the today what the community suffers is if you look at whether it's the society around them, the family around them, or the environment around them, there is this whole shame which is uh, associated with having a different sexual orientation than the so-called mainstream people. And this somewhere needs to go away. And if I remember correctly, during the final judgment, there was one passage, I can't remember, was it uh, Justice Nariman or Chandrachud who said to make sure that this judgment is sent to every small panchayat, to every small village, every small town, so that people become aware of what the courts or what the legal system stands for it and they accept it. Because you see, as I said, it's not about first, as I said, you have your inner fight and then you, let's say you find the strength to come out to your parents. Then first thing you hear is, lo kya kahenge? family kya kahenge? at job. You know, on one hand, we talk about great corporates who have always accepted the community and have never discriminated. But on the other hand, they may do it on, let's say, a policy making level. But how do you take away the discrimination that they face day to day basis with their colleagues? Because even if you have a policy, you can't change that. And that is something that will only happen when there's a greater awareness with the people 
that hang on, this is as normal as any other thing. I don't know if this will happen in my lifetime or not, but I think each of us need to make that effort, whether it's with the people around you. Just to give you an example, after the 2018 verdict came in, I mean, okay, I don't know if it was to brain brownie points or not. All our offices, all our restaurants, our team, and when we talk about restaurants, we're talking about not fancy level of people working or educate 80% of the people who work in my company are totally uneducated. They made sure that every cabin door had a rainbow sticker posted on it. They put this big sign, love is equal all around. And because they had worked with a boss who was a lesbian herself, I think over the years, they got more easy with the idea. They became at ease. We had a lot of, I called it my baseball team. We had five gay women in my company and we used to say, this is our baseball team. So there was a slow conditioning that happened with these people who coming from villages or whatever, realized that this is normal. This is okay. And this but needs to happen at every level. As I said, making corporate laws that, okay, there's been no discrimination. It doesn't help because you need to still face your colleagues on day-to-day -day basis. You still need to uh, face your family, your society, your relatives around you on day-to-day -day basis. And this will only happen when there's this greater awareness, when there's a greater acceptance. And when I talk about acceptance, it's not that, hang on, I have a, a broken knee or something, so you got to accept that I have a broken knee and feel sorry for me. It's not. It is a very integral part of me and it is okay. There's nothing wrong with me. And I used to always say when after this case we filed, I mean, I'm a citizen of this country. I pay shit loads of taxes. I pay a lot of employees. I have made this country proud. So why should I be any different? And this has to be something which has to be right from the grassroot level to the top that you are no different. Yes. Who you sleep with, maybe not a conventional choice, but the difference has to change. You know, I always say in my company, whether it's women or men, there has to be a sense of equality for work. Women can't get away by saying that, you know, I need to leave four hours early because I have four kids to feed. If you want to be in the same space as men, then you also need to be equal. And I say the same about the LGBTQI community as well. You are equal to everyone else and you are no different from anywhere. And that has to start right from the bottom and this is a very long journey, unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. final thoughts. So, Pragya, to your question earlier, uh, I think it's, uh, yes, the LGBTQIA community looks like one cohesive whole to a person who's kind of distant to it. I think like any painting, if you go close by, you'll see the granular aspects, the differences, the changes in it. And I think it's true to say that the experiences of uh, a gay person are different from the experience of a, a, a trans person, of an intersex person. And, uh, and within that, there are differences of caste, class, uh, sex. And I draw a parallel possibly uh, with the, the, the feminist movement, right? Uh, there are intersectionalities there as well. So you have to appreciate the difference as well as the commonalities. And I think to focus just on one or the other, is to do a great disservice to, to the movement as a whole. Uh, so when you are pushing for equality on the LGBTI community, it's good to come together and you may accept your differences, but you present a united front and say there are certain problems that face all of us. A question of discrimination of, on employment, a question of Section 377 is a feature that everybody faces in matters of housing and insurance, the rich and the poor face which uh, those of us who are privileged by being men, upper caste, wealthy, will not face, which someone else who does not have the privilege does face. Now, it's important for me also to be aware of that and try to remedy that. Uh, so it's important when you look at the larger picture, not to forget those individual instances of discrimination as well, and not to sweep the already underprivileged under the carpet and make them even more invisible. In my quest for... Uh, getting equality, I can't make the invisible even more invisible, right? 
so yes, there are problems of trans people, intersex people, uh, and as I said, all the other, uh, I would say, deeply, deeply marginalized communities within the LGBTQIA community, and where to be aware of it. And the question is, how do we deal with that, right? Uh, I think sometimes people get a bit carried away and say that we reject the larger movement because the movement is only about those particular aspects of uh, great deprivation. No, it isn't. It can be simultaneous and the two are not mutually exclusive. As long as we're aware that the trans community faces a much greater discrimination than a gay person does, uh, you're already on some path towards reconciliation. We're already a minority. To splinter ourselves amongst further minorities, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Right? So it's important to go together as a cohesive whole, accept that there are changes and there are differences as they inevitably are in any, any movement between uh, different sections of, of, of an oppressed, even a minority. As I said, women are not a minority, but even within the majority of women who are uh, in our country, there, there are differences. So we aim to deal with individual issues on a case-by-case -case basis, which is specific to each of those uh, particular uh, disadvantaged communities. So trans, transgender people have a judgment nalsar because there are question of, uh, uh, you know, recently I, I saw it, it's quite heartening that there's going to be gender reassignment which is happening in government of, uh, hospitals. But sh that should not be made mandatory to get uh, certain uh, employment benefits, right? The government shouldn't insist on that. Uh, so there are problems with the new Trans Rights Act. So we fight that battle as well. But while we're fighting that battle against uh, for, the, for trans rights and for intersex rights, we can't forget that at the end of the day, we are sexual minorities as well. And there is a dialogue we have to have with the sexual ma ma majority as one which pre presents us as, as a group. Because there is strength in numbers as well. I don't think we can forget that. So to just give that up and say that, no, no, we are all individual instances and, and I'm a minority, uh, it's kind of breaking it down to a kind of quasi casteist uh, yeah. level of uh, already fragmented minority. It makes no sense tactically and practically. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I have a lot more questions, but I believe our time is up. So thank you very much, Saurabh. Thank you so much. Thank this you. Was thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Have fun, Saurabh. Those of you listening to us, this is a fabulous initiative by Roly Books called Roly Pulse. And uh, if you want to listen to more of such sessions, it's available on all their social media outlets. So please do check them out. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.